beers, and now you're ready to listen to some threat intel. We're all ready. All right. I'm going to start off to make sure you guys are awake. How many people in here use threat intel within your organization right now? What? Threat intel. Any type of threat intelligence at your office, in one fashion or the other. One, two, three, couple. Oh, look at all these people. Great. How many of you pay for the service? A couple. Okay. Is it worthwhile? Okay, great. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. So, <clears throat> I do, uh, I'm a manager for a large company. I do cyber forensics. I have a team of quite a few people that are spread around the world. And part of what we use is threat intelligence to determine things that may happen to us or is happening right now. And when people talk about threat intelligence in this venue, we're going to talk about cyber threat intelligence, but it's really not the only piece that we deal with. Um, I deal with a lot of companies. Part of it uh, is cyber focused. Some of it is focused at uh, maybe physical threats, uh, discussions that happen on blogs, uh, web pages, things like that. But primarily, uh, a lot of the groups here that I work with, um, they ingest cyber intelligence through a number of different vendors and open source intelligence. <clears throat> when we talk about threat, cyber threat intelligence, a lot of people use NIST as, you know, what is a threat? Possible danger. It really, to generate threat intelligence, you don't have to have a threat. And we'll talk about some of the threat actors that are out there that are trying to look at your companies, investigate what you have, and maybe explore your perimeters and what they can get into, and the intelligence. There may be, may be some of that or maybe not. In short, threat, bad guys, intelligence, predicting the future or predicting what's happening now or what may happen six months from now, nine months from now, and putting those two things together to understand what's out there in the world that may impact you today or tomorrow. Oop. Let's see here. Now let's talk about who generates threat intelligence or threat data. There's a lot of people here and out there that are researchers and intentionally good, bad, indifferent. They're out there, maybe they're looking through their logs, they're looking at activity on some blog, whatever it may be, they're doing research out there. And as they're doing that research, they're developing activity that is observable by someone, somewhere. They're crossing the internet, and we're collecting that data. So some of you are researchers, some of you are security people, innocent or not. Also, we're seeing quite a bit of prelude to conflict, Syria, um, all the different events in the world. They're probing the network. Uh, I work for a lot of different power companies. And we routine, routinely see the Chinese, the Russians, and Syrians, and everybody, they're looking at the security of the infrastructure for these different power generation uh, companies. Because in case something happens in the world, they want to know how to shut down our power grid. A lot of the commercial customers, tons of organized crime activity. I have a large customer. We have one in, I think, four social security numbers and one in seven PI records. Tons of data, especially medical data. Before, people would steal credit card information. Now there's so much of that on the market. It went from, it used to be $1.50 a record. I think it's down to about 10 cents a record now for a credit card number. It's worth nothing. Healthcare records, anywhere from $25 to $100 on the market. So. Very valuable, very useful information. So they're hitting the databases. Um, I also have a lot of private investigators that are going after large companies. Uh, they're paid to win a divorce case, and they will get that data one way or the other. Once again, they leave their home or their office, they transit the network, and somebody's watching that. And of course, we have the hacktivists. There is so much of that activity right now um, banks are a great target. Um, you make a statement that is not politically correct, they will come after you, and I think we've seen that in the news quite often. 
So when we talk about why these people are generated, besides money, um, I have a, had a large retail customer, 40,000 stores, tons of cash registers all over the place. And they're like, God, why are our cash registers so slow? We can't hardly do a transaction. So we said, well, you're here doing some other work. Can you look at our cash register? IT says it's fine. Well, we go on there. They have a botnet on there doing Bitcoin generation. So they got 40,000 cash registers generating Bitcoins. And they're selling that data right out to the internet. That was fun. <laughs> ton of money. They're making a ton of money that way. Uh, nation state, we saw what the White House yesterday, they figured out, gee, it was the Russians again. And of course, the intellectual property. So all of that activity goes across the internet. Someone's looking at that besides NSA. Now, anybody see North Spike in their cool little demo? Yeah, it's pretty, right? There's about 10 vendors that put that IP in the up there. It's awesome. I had a customer that said, put that data in our sock. Even though it's not ours, it's awesome. And customers go, ooh. <laughs> so we have that and two other vendors up on the top wall. They said it's awesome. So remember those little points? North has, what do they say, like 8 million sensors, whatever it may be, all over the world. And they come in, they pitch their deals. We look at everything everywhere. We're in every major hosted facility around the world. And <clears throat> their intelligence is original, which means they're finding it. They're not going out and OEMing it from someplace else. They're generating that data. They're seeing that guy trying to go over there and do something to them, and they're recording that. And they're packaging it, and they're going to sell it to their customers. Then you have other customers that are like, oh, man. That's expensive. Eight million endpoints. We've got to manage all that data in this gigantic database. We can't do it. What we'll do is we'll harvest data from what's available on the internet. We'll package all this stuff up and we'll offer service to our customers that said, okay, Mr. Healthcare Company, we're going to watch data focus right on you. And it works or it doesn't work for some people. But So this is an example of some of the people, non-governmental, that are collecting this data. And we're going to talk about how well or how not well they do things. So threat intel, cyber threat intel, if you're familiar with this. <coughs> this is a sample of data that we see. We see an IP address. OK, great. This IP address, uh, if you're in law enforcement, you used to track um, known associates. You're committing a crime. We're going to watch you, and you talk to him, and you talk to him. You call him. You email that guy, and we tie it all together. Known associates. We do the same thing with IP addresses. This IP is tied to that. Useful, not. You know, we, we could tell that it's a DGA type of infection. Eh. Otherwise, it's like it could be anything. We get into something a little bit more useful. Okay, we got an IP. We saw it on that day. Oh, ooh, they gave us the kill chain phase. That's kind of neat. Part of the command control network. Great. And it's an IP watch list. So, and great, we've got to know. We saw this IP talking to US government hosts. It was associated with these domains. So, what? How helpful is that? You can have your analysts go track that down. You know how many of these things I get or used to get? And my customers were like, oh, let's go look. And it's nothing. You only have a finite number of analysts to follow up on this stuff. But Common threat intelligence, kind of raw, a little bit processed, not much value. <clears throat> Got a buddy that has a security company. You saw the raw data, and you're like, well, how many of these records are you getting? A couple a day, a thousand. Some of your large organizations are getting, I think we're getting close to a terabyte of logs per day. So lots of stuff. Because this is an hour snapshot, you can see that's what 100,000 K of ingested threat intelligence raw data logs. What is that? Two million, something like that, for the last hour. Imagine just feeding that to your SOC analyst. Now they would go nuts. So he's pulling in millions of IOCs, not IOCs, but indicators every day of attacks, or potential attacks. And he clearly breaks it down into, well, some of it's exploits, bad tools, hijacks, pedophiles, all kinds of neat stuff. So he kind of takes that data and he categorizes it. So if you're interested in something like that, you get a feed of that data and you can work with it. You can manipulate it. You can perhaps ingest it into something useful. So 
This is just kind of a sample ingest rate from one vendor. Two million hits. And these are all some sensors, but could you imagine somebody that has eight million sensors? What kind of data that they're seeing? You saw the earlier thread and tell with that IP address and that domain. And if you're an analyst, you hate these. There's also threat intelligence in the form of, this is from, I forgot, I think this is from the high trust. So we get these every day. And if you have to deal with this, you know what a waste of time this is because somebody has to go in here and pull up, now that we have here, this one especially here, PasteFit. Somebody uploaded two million credentials to PasteFit. So <clears throat> if you do that manually, and I have a company that's 250,000 employees, and you've got to go through there and notify all 250,000 people that the credentials are posted out on Pastebin. It's a headache. So this is great if you're in a low volume environment, but in a high volume where you're getting tons of threat intelligence packages every day, you want to be able to take this and process it and adjust it and automate it. Because otherwise, you're going to get killed. This is useful from a threat intelligence perspective just to do research on or low volume. Or you have an unlimited budget with tons of analysts that can sit there and go through this. <clears throat> Not all the threat intel is the same. Everybody's thinking ILCs, malware indicators, domains, actors, email addresses. No. I mean, it is, but there's a lot of companies that are harvesting data Hey, one company that they want to know what every single competitor employee is doing on Facebook, Twitter. They're scraping all the data off of that and ingesting these articles into a threat intelligent database where it's processed. And we have certain strings that says, you know, if it's that name and mentioning this and this and this, it's popping up to an analyst. And it could be pictures, which is hard. So when you think threat intelligence, pictures, places, it's all a context. So this, this is fun to do actually. It's a real headache, a lot of data. But once you have something like this working, um, it actually works really well. It, this is set up to parse sub, almost every news agency in the world that has a public feed. So large database, large amounts of data. Now, <clears throat> I'll mention it a little bit farther down, but when you're spending, somebody had, you guys were paying for pay service, right? 50 grand, 100 grand, who's paying like half a million a year? 100,000? 100,000, right. Does your boss make you go through and prove a metric? Yeah, okay. so I've got customers that routinely spend over between one to $10 million. And they go, ooh, ooh there's a threat intel vendor, there's bad stuff, go pay for it. And they pay for it, and analysts go, we don't have time for this. And they pay 250,000 a year in renewals for this one. You got 10 of those, all of a sudden you've got millions of dollars. Well, it's crazy, absolutely insane. If, hey, you want to keep your job and you want to show value to the organization, which is what we should do, and keep the service, you want to be able to produce some type of metric. You know, you've got all this data coming in, we'll talk about how to do that, but. All this data is coming in from all your feeds, you're seeing all this stuff. <coughs> Up here, we got a nice report. We have here, I don't have my glasses on, but we have active intelligence. We're getting data from maybe some vendor from five years ago. Do we want it active? Yeah. We want to make sure it's active. We got inactive, and we have pending where it hasn't been processed for analysis yet. Do we want to deal with it? Do we want to do the work, or do we want somebody else to do the analysis before we get it? And most importantly, it's all positive. Most of the data that you're going to get is false positive. You're going to see tons of stuff. You're going to see this guy went to there, and what do you do with it? Is it actionable? No. Does it mean anything? No. Can you qualify it? No. And a lot of times, you have false data being reported to the threat intelligence vendor, and it's, it's false positive. It's garbage. So you get a metric out of the stuff that comes in. Now, I got, let's say, 20 million pieces of raw data coming in per day. Most of this is low. Do I want to act on it? Probably not. I probably want to focus on, on this chunk here and be 
able to say, the management that says, I've got 6,000 pieces of high value, high threat intelligence coming in, affecting us. And they pay for that. So you want to be able to say, yes, we took it, we consumed it, we correlated it, we matched it, nothing affects us, and we're watching it. That's a metric, it's a good metric. Um, other than that, you know, this is kind of where I look. I take in uh, four or five, you know, 50 different vendors, and I put them all in here, and go, where am I getting my data from? Um, I get some vendor, I one vendor I pay $400,000 a year on, you can't even see him. Produces hardly anything. They're just taking the cash. That money just keeps coming in, they're loving it. So when I get that metric, when the renewals come up next year, guess what happens to them? Bye bye. All right, you saw some data. You want some threat intelligence if you don't have any, right? You know you want it, go ahead. Who is that measure? I can't tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> Were they recently purchased? Uh, we can talk later. <laughs> uh, if you guys have questions offline, unofficial, not oh. public, we can have a discussion just based on my experience, opinion of where your money should go and not go. I don't want to get sued, but I tell you what, I've dealt with a lot of them, and uh, you, know, you can draw your own conclusions. <laughs> when you get a chance, sometime before your lecture is over, could you provide us, generically speaking, a handful of threat intelligence vendors that we could research on our own? Coming up. Thanks. Coming up. Coming up. Um, PayPal is just blocked by Active. Is that going to be a threat? That's coming up. I want to talk about what's happening in this industry. I've, I've been in this industry for 25 years. Um, <clears throat> I've done SIM work, I've done some of the largest SIM implementations in the world for many, many customers, and the most exciting thing right now is actually being able to use threat intelligence. Because before, collecting this data and processing it and analyzing it and doing it in such a fashion where I didn't have to have 300 people, now there's enough brains, computing power, and smart people that can automate this and consume it and display it in an actual fashion that's worthwhile. And this is why you're seeing such a big boom, a multi-billion dollar boom in threat intelligence. All right, now you're excited. Threat intel, how do you get it, right? <clears throat> I deal with federal, international, I get threat intelligence from everybody and their brother. Um, DOD, DOD intel's not bad. However, if you're not in DOD land, you're not getting it. I mean, they've got some great stuff. Um, I worked over in Middle East, and every day or every couple days, you get this little bulletin that comes down and says, you will do this to these people and this data. Boom. Beautiful. Loved it. Some analysts had already processed it and had an action taken. So we just went out there and did do 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 done. Can't get that now. FBI, how many get the FBI alerts? Do they suck or what? <laughs> you go out there and you get these FBI alerts <clears throat> and you're like, ooh, FBI, they gotta be right on the ball. Well, they're not giving it to us. They're giving us crap. The stuff that they give you has been out on the open source community for three or four months. And when they give you a list of IOCs, Google, Yahoo, Excite, you're like, okay, what do we do with this? Nothing, we trash it. But I tell you what, in every organization I've been at, um, anytime I get an FBI alert, everything stops, everybody searches for those IOCs, and we write up a paper that says, we found nothing. Same thing, uh, uh, NERC, there's these NERC alerts, there's all these different alerts that they come from certain sources, and from a clinical standpoint, you have to drop what you're doing, especially in healthcare, and say, yes, we search for that. I remember the, the Sony one and uh, the Premier one, uh, we had some interesting inside information on that, and guess what? We spent weeks digging through every single one of these acquired entities that we owned around the world, making sure that none of that stuff was there. But from a political standpoint, they can say, we looked for it. Now, we just looked for it, and I said, great, let's automate it, let's do all this work, we'll put it in an automated fashion, so tomorrow, if it happens, boom, we'll get alerted. No, no, we don't need to do that. Politically, they covered their butt, and that was it. The one thing that bothers me about the federal state intelligence, oh, by the way, State? Anybody hear anything from the state? I worked in so many different states. A couple of them are not too bad. Most of them, there's nothing. There is nothing available for you. So much, you know, thank you. 
And, and I know, I, th I think from what I talk to them, there's not that big of a group that I know of. I mean, um, I speak at the New York State Cybersecurity Conference. They have a big program. They have all kinds of stuff. They bring people in. And I'm trying to get Florida to do that, where they bring in all their businesses and share. But they keep telling me they have no budget. So. And when we look at um, the breach, right? We had the FBI. We had tons of stuff happening, billions of dollars in losses. Is anybody doing it? You know, where's the national initiative of putting something together? not just internally, but from all the people that are coming after us. In, in, in 1993, I, I worked at the Sprint Company, and they had gates, guards, locked down, and they couldn't figure out why the French and Israelis were stealing their stuff and coming out to the market six months ahead of time. Boy, they were just pissed because they spent all that money. So I said, well, let me go look. I walked into it, I'm looking around, I'm like, ooh, this is great, got cameras. Got guards, you've got a great physical control. And I look, I go, oh, well, you have these Unix machines. Let's see where they go. Well, you follow all these Unix machines that they did all the development on. They connected to the rest of the corporate network. Well, the corporate network was compromised by French, Chinese, no, it wasn't Chinese, Israelis and French at that time. And so all that security was worthless. But that that's 13, well, 93, that's a long time ago. Oof, I'm getting old. But <laughs> now it happens. Daily. I can't tell you how many foreign nation states are going after stuff that I have. I don't get anything from the FBI that's telling me. I don't get a federal or state response that's helping me out. And I know they have the data. And I know they have, it's nothing secret. They gather stuff the same way we do. The way we do. So I, I don't know. It bothers the hell out of me. Anyway. Okay. So we can't get it from the Fed. We can't get it from the state. You go to your vendors. And we love vendors, right? Big vendors, big bucks, as well as big BS. This is a very large vendor. If you have this tool at your office or corporation, you would probably recognize this. You know, it's the same story from every single vendor. We have the latest threat data. We do this, we do that. No, they don't. They're one company. They're either buying their intelligence from someplace else, or they have a subset of what the community would have. Um, and, and I can talk about some of these vendors here in a second. They irritate me. But just, it's a bedtime story. You know, tell me the story so I'll buy it from you. And what happens is, unfortunately, you go to these big companies, you go in there and you say, you know what, don't buy this because you can get it for that. Politically, they'll spend $250,000 on the latest, uh, let's see, ArcSight package or RSA package or XYZ package. I mean, it drives me crazy. Big business, right? I was talking about that earlier. Here's some of the big vendors that we kind of we dealt with. And when, when I say good, they're only good if you hold their feet to the fire. Most of these contracts are terrible. Uh, I can give it Dell Security Works. Uh, we, we did a went to a customer that said, you know what, we're spending eight hundred thousand dollars a year. We have so many consulting hours and so many analyst hours. We want to understand where the value is. So I said, great, let's take this latest threat thing that's kind of scary to us and let's let our internal four analysts do the research on it. Let's time them, engage the quality of their analysis, and let's send it out to uh, it was SecureWorks, CrowdStrike, iDefense, and we send it out to them. Eight hours later, no response. I'm like, our SMA is four hours. So we pick up the phone, call them, going, well, where's the data? Oh, right, we're working on it. We're all the other analysts were done in about two and a half, three hours. Wrote up some nice papers, had lots of data in there, and they said, this is what's going on. These guys come back going, uh, uh, Secure Works looks like they just Googled it and posted a bunch of crap in there that we already had. And <laughs> iDefense, did, and they probably did the best job, and it was fine, but they did a great job. And CrowdStrike was like, oh, we don't have anything on it. That's a lot of money. If they can't provide me more in-depth analysis that my on-site analysts can do that they're pulling from open source intelligence in their own sources, why are they spending $800,000 a year? And I've told many a company, I says, how many FTEs or contractors, or preferably FTEs, 
can you get for $800,000 a year that sit there and do threat intelligence analysis all day long? And they go, oh, oh, oh. but you say that word FTEs, they're like, oh, we don't want FTEs, we don't want FTEs. Anyway, so these all pay, all good to one degree or the other. Um, there's, there's some more, I could share some, I guess you want to fill up a slide with a bunch of people, but um, you know, it really depends on what your focus is on threat intelligence. What are you going to do with that data? And we'll talk about that a little bit later because your use of threat intelligence is going to be completely different from yours and yours and yours. So that's what you got to figure out when you pick these vendors and what data feeds you're going to get from them. Oh, and the fun one, yeah. This, this one here is paying 2.1. None of their analysts use this service at all. None of them. One of them, uh, uh, one of them has a uh, PI on staff, and all he did was like track his old girlfriend's down. That's all he did. It was awesome. I mean, it worked out for him. All right. Now, I go to a lot of companies, and they say, you know what, threat intelligence, you said 800, 400, 100. Nobody has budget. Or they can't get it, they can't justify it, or it's a year out. And I stole the what's in your wallet kind of thing from whoever they are, but I have no budget. Well, you have a ton of threat intelligence data within your organization, ton. And people don't understand that. They're like, what do you mean threat intelligence? Well, no one attacks your company. Your employees aren't doing stupid things. You don't have security controls, really? I beg to differ. I know all of you have firewalls, one form or the other. If you have like some cool ones like Palo Alto or the new checkpoints or the uh, Fortinet, you're going to get some cool stuff. You're going to get geographical data. You're going to get some domains. You're going to get some intrusion detection signatures. You're going to get a lot of cool stuff from that firewall, allowed or denied. That's great threat intelligence. DNS queries. That thing is awesome, people. DNS? What are you logging DNS for? Uh, have you guys ever had a DNS telling attack? Are they sucking out terabytes of data through DNS tunnels? Or somebody using your company as a DNS application tag and you're blowing somebody off the network every week and you get a subpoena to appear in court because you keep blowing the other company off the network? Oh, well, we have a DNS. Great data in there, too. IPS, IDS goes without saying, but nobody takes that data. It seems nobody has an idea of what threat management means. They don't take all of this data that you're collecting and they don't build a profile. They don't understand who, why, or what people are after. They don't know the type of attacks they're being targeted with. They don't even know their own vulnerabilities or their risks. So there's no threat profile of what the <coughs> enterprise looks like. Data's there. With this data, we know who's attacking you, how they're attacking you, and usually with what tools. But no one's taking that data and putting it together going, Oh, it's the Chinese again. It's, you know, Mr. Wang over there. He's fired up his XYZ tool, and now instead of going after these five IPs, he's going after the mail server today. You kill him off there. You block his IP address. Oh, look, he's in a place in Texas now because we have his threat profile. We blocked China, but now he's in Texas. But we know his signature. We know how he attacks. We know what he does. He's going to make a living just like us. Um, this, this is awesome. This host space IPS. How, how, many, how many have, uh, anybody have Invincia? Anything cool like that? Or, uh, oh, come on. I know it's Florida, but <laughs> nobody has it, huh? <laughs> how about Cybera? Nothing cool like that? I tell you what, look at those two products. You may put yourself out of business, but I tell you, it saved the corporation a lot. Um, Symantec, Trend Micro, McAfee. Mm -hmm. We all got that, right? You don't think that generates a ton of logs? Awesome logs. I can, people are like, how can you figure out where my lateral attacks are coming or going to? I go, well, you have McAfee, you have Symantec, now you're getting the firewall data? I, can, I go in there and I go, oh, look, you've got a lateral. You, this machine is infected, this machine, this is Like, oh, when did that log happen? They go, oh, wait now. No visibility. They weren't collecting that threat data. Uh, FireEye, <laughs> Dambella, Glassline, great data point. Uh, email. People don't log their email. I start, I get, I forget how many millions of emails we get every day at this one customer. Like, so I think it's like five million, maybe it's five million. It's a tremendous amount. Tremendous amount. 97 point something is blocked. 
I go, oh, what'd you do with that data? Oh, we got it. I'm like, are you crazy? If you pull that data, and this is, this is a cool thing we would do on, on some of these products, <clears throat> we take all the email blocks, you know, the fishy one, click here to say hi to grandma and send her five bucks, or click here for your American Express or your fax. Those links are a gold mine. You take those links, we tie it into FireEye, FireEye goes out, crawls all those links. What does the FireEye Maz do? If you're familiar with it. FireEye Maz will take all of that information, feed it up to FireEye Cloud, and then guess where it goes? It goes right to your FireEye appliance at the perimeter. All those zero days, semantic, the McAfee will never know about, guess who's gonna stop them? FireEye, and it got that data that FireEye doesn't know about, but it got it from all those emails that were blocked. And think about all the executables that you're getting. Tons of executables. What do you do with that first one that goes through? Um, Specifically FireEye. Uh, yours go through? Every FireEye uh, <laughs> new thread, the first one goes through. Right. It depends. I mean, if the first one goes through, we know that it went through. And usually, they, they pick it up when. There was one that went out uh, last week. It was a two-hour delay, right? That two-hour delay, depending on your corporate policy, if it's an executable, I know a lot of corporations, they say, if there's an embedded executable, we're not taking it. If it's a zip, if we can't expect that zip, we're not taking it. Why would you bring that risk into your organization? I, I tell corporate, okay, you want to send password protective stuff? Great. But my IES staff, the security guys, give them that password because it's going to be unencrypted and inspected before it goes into the organization. It took eight months to get that approved, but there's so, phishing attacks are like the number one most awesome thing. I do pen testing, and <clears throat> I don't even bother doing pen tests anymore, because everybody's dumb enough to click on an email that I'll craft, and I'll send them something, and I, I, I tell you, I get the CISO, I get all these people every single time, and they get it. They finally get it when I'm like doing funny stuff to them, they get it. Until this stuff happens to your users, they don't get it. Seeing is believing. Um, so on, on your point, <clears throat> the first one gets through. Um, if it's an executable, it goes down to a workstation, hopefully, if it's a zero day. In fact, semantics useless, McAfee's useless, all this AV stuff is useless. They'll tell you, we're 30, 40% effective. Look it up. It's been useless for years. That's why I mention things like Invincia, Cybera, um, there's a big defense contractor that was getting nailed all the time, and they were told by the government, says, one more time, you're gone. No more business with the federal government. They put in Invincia across the organization, their incidents went down to zero. Everybody is starting to virtualize their applications. You know, application whitelisting with Bit9, okay, so what? Uh, we're using carbon black with that, so what? You better start virtualizing your Outlook, your browsers, these different applications. Otherwise, you're gonna still get nailed time after time after time. Anyway, um, AV activity, pull that data in, number of viruses, types of viruses, um, proxy activity, you know, people, you know, you're trying to go out to the proxy 99,000 times to a malware block domain. That's good threat intelligence to know. Um, this thing here, this is awesome. How many of you have honeypots? Couple, right? You use a modern honey net, or are you doing your own? Okay, I'm lazy, right? Greg Martin, those guys over at ThreatStream, put together the modern honey net, you load it up, you toss it out there, it's awesome. It's, uh, I go to ADS, I go to all these free web hosting services, I have honey pots all over the world, free, it's awesome. And they feed me all kinds of data, whether it's, <clears throat> the Chinese brute forces, the Chinese uh, malware, the spammers, the fisher, all of that data is being fed in here. I take these, I've got a bunch of old IT resources, I toss them all the way around my perimeter. They're like, well, what's, <laughs> see, I would call me up, because what's our attack situation awareness? And I, I stopped and I says, well, I, hmm. I go, you know what, it sucks, doesn't it? We put that out there, because we knew the attacks that were going out against the assets that we were logging 
but we didn't have a complete picture of all the attacks that were occurring against all of our subnets throughout the world. We have a ton of dead machines. Tons of IP address space. Loaded up there, we have a couple honeypots sitting on the perimeter. All of a sudden now, our situational awareness just exploded. We started seeing stuff we never thought about. We started grabbing malware, tons of zero days, and all that data gets fed into our collective intelligence framework. Awesome. Uh, don't forget your perimeter routers and switches that are sitting outside the firewall. Tons of stuff. Good, actionable intelligence that you can use later on down the road. And this thing here, I found this little thing on the internet. If you're in healthcare, um, to some extent in energy, you have groups. Um, I get on these calls with all the energy companies in the United States, and they're starting to collaborate. However, a lot of them are deathly afraid to tell anything what happened. Um, getting people to talk about incidents at their company, um, there's frameworks for, to allow a limited amount of information. If anything else, just say, you know what, we observed this type of activity, but let people know, hey, there's this malware, there's this type of activity, and share it, collaborate. Talk to other people at wherever you can talk. Share that information. Absolutely vital that you do, because if I'm getting attacked with it, pretty much you're all gonna get the same thing. And I see data from many, many different types of entities, and a lot of it's identical, written by the same people that are very interested in us. All right, so you had what's in your wallet. Open source. I love open source intelligence to a point. Last I looked, there was 176 open source intelligence data sources. That's a lot of data. There's a lot of people that are very interested and they dedicate a ton of resources to collect information and share it. Um, on this screen here, this is the modern honey net um, sample. If you load it up, it comes with a nice GUI. You let it run on your home router for less than two minutes, you will start seeing people bounce against you. And all that data gets collected and you can do your own stuff with it. But 176 open source data feeds. Grab it, use it. It's there, it's free. But you have to do some work. Okay. So, you've got the data that's in your wallet, right? In your organization, you've got all that data being sucked in. You hooked up to 176 open source data feeds and you're getting blasted like fire hose just with data. Well, you get an IP address. How many people are analysts? Or, okay. Don't you love getting, oh, this IP is bad. He's going to a bad site. You get a ticket on that. And you're like, oh. You go to that thing, you do your research, you find out there's 367,000 domains on there. What's the point? There's nothing else. You have an IP address. Then you go, okay, that IP address blocks me. Yeah, I don't care. There's 367 Chinese origami sites. Let's block it. And this has happened. This has been awesome. So block that IP. They blocked the root DNS server one time. Oh. It was the funniest thing ever. Uh, same thing. Business partner. They're internal pen testers who were awesome. Um, they ones who scanned the country of Italy and had the Italian government call us going, what are you doing? Um, they decided to scan our internal corporate network, not realizing that there was a NAT between us and a large financial client. They're scanning away, they're getting their stuff, they're doing all the pen testing. All of a sudden we get a call from the FBI. <coughs> and the big bank going, you guys have been hacked. Well, you know what? The bank blocked their IP address. You know how many millions of dollars of transactions that did not go out for those two days? <laughs> so you gotta think about that. It's part of the whole quality thing. Um, same thing, email addresses. Email addresses are very valuable. Um, if you, uh, how many people use Multigo? Multigo's awesome, right? 
you throw an IP address in there, and you throw it in Aaron, you'll see that that guy owns 450 domains, and they're all shitty. All of a sudden now, I got a bad guy, and I got a list of all 450 of his shitty domains that I can block, no problem. So don't overlook that email address. Phishing, take all those, spam, but you gotta make sure that they're decent. You gotta kinda make sure the quality is there. You gotta validate that. Um, this IP address thing here, this is another thing. We have 250,000 clients. We're going to a website, on port 80 and 443. We know it's a bad website, but we know that the analysts can't hand it off to the SOC, much less to the organization to pull that machine off the network because they can't tell you. You know, typically an organization, your job is to say, this machine is compromised, we can prove it, this, 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 and this, and then we'll take it and then we'll actually do something with it. I can't tell how many times, and maybe you can chime in here, but this thing's going on port 80, 443. So now you got PCAP, you're looking at port 80, oh, got him. No problem, 443. Not many people are doing SSL decryption. Yeah. I, I have one thing. Uh, a lot of my customers now, if they're in the U.S., they've had it. If their customers are not in the U.S., they're blocking the rest of the world. They don't care. You know, this China, Kazakhstan, blah, 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 whatever it is. They're blocking everything. They don't want to deal with it. It's costing them way too much time. I got one that does a lot of business in China. We see 300 machines going to China on port 443. We don't know what it's doing. We're not doing SSL decryption. It says it's bad. We, we look at our threat intelligence database, well, it's 50-50. I can't go out and pull two, three, four hundred machines off the network and figure out that they're listening to music. It's tough. It is really tough. But SSL decryption is coming to most corporations because what's the number way to external show data? Well, besides DNS, that's the easiest, but doing SSL because nobody's looking at it. I do pen tests. First thing I go, most of these templates are so sloppy, you go in there and you're sucking all the data out and you've got access to both corporations and they're not even monitoring that your baseline of 443 traffic should be like this and then I get on there just like this and then much less at two o'clock on Saturday or Sunday where it's like this, they don't have that threat intelligence there. They don't, they're not pulling that flow data in, they're not trending ports, they're not trending any traffic. That's actually threat intelligence data. Uh, now we're in the caters. We love dealing with those, but are they actual valid? When you run them through, we took a piece of malware, we ran it through Joe Sandbox uh, and some of these other ones, and we got three different results. They had it. So if you want to get down to it, is it actionable or false positive from a quality standpoint? And always validate the source reporter. All right. So as you go through here and kind of try to build this before it's value, source destination port, so what? Source destination port activity. You keep building it up to get the value. You kind of build the context of the threat, tell intel activity and the activity and the history of things that are out there and matching it to what's going on in your corporation. You're starting to get something there with the data. All right, so what do you do with it? If you're not using it, you better, because I tell you what, IOCs are out daily, indicators are compromised. Threat intelligence is post like every second. The problem is, most companies don't have time, and are you authorized to do anything with threat intelligence with your company or share that with anybody? And the most compelling question is, how do you do it? All this stuff's out there for you to do it, except your ability to execute. How do you process it? How do you ingest it? Analyze, correlate, respond, and report on it. And how do you prove that it's worth anything? You did all of this, show management that you saved them a breach worth X dollars. Oh, you do all of this stuff. And then how do you react to it? You get the threat intelligence data. Now does your incident response program deal with some of this stuff that you're finding? That's always fun. People run around with their heads off, screaming. You're getting the feeds. There are, you can go out and buy threat intelligence that you can ingest. Our site has Intel, RSA has First Watch, Alien Ball. You gotta pay up, baby. And it's not cheap. Not cheap at all. Um, some of you may have played 
been around the collective intelligence framework on Google. Uh, Greg Martin wrote uh, our cozy for Arctic a couple years ago, which turned into a commercial venture called Threadstream. Most of those things now are going into Hadoop. We can ingest a lot of data into Hadoop. We can query it. I do a query on our site, three hours. Hadoop, 15 seconds. Um, but you gotta have somebody that knows how to implement it, how to ingest it, how to present the data. There's a lot of stuff. And you're starting to see these vendors are scared of this because people are doing it for free. Um, biggest problem is ingestion. Two million, at the very beginning we saw 2.3 million an hour. How fast can you suck that into your database? Can you normalize it so you can search it? You gotta, data normalization is the toughest thing you can do when you pull this stuff in. And how can you consume it and how can you feed it? I'm going fast because I know I have a couple minutes left. Oh, I got 15. Well, give me that five. Maybe 10. Okay, 10. <laughs> All right. So this is kind of an example. This is the collective intelligence framework. And up here, you may have all your feeds, your firewalls, your routers, your switches, all that data is coming in. It's going to your collective intelligence framework server. You've got your public feeds from all your OSINT sources. Um, you got to present it. The data is in here, so what? <laughs> I'm on a project right now. I am logging. We have to get like 50 petabytes of data to deal with their log data. They're logging. I go, what are you going to do with it when you get it? They're like, I don't know. We'll figure it out. The price tag on this is in the millions. But they wanted me to compliance by so do a log. They forgot the quality monitor part. Um, so you get down to here in the collective intelligence framework. Now you can query it. You see something happening on your network. This machine is talking to that. Boom. Type it in there. Bam. Here's all of this great intelligence stuff. The whole history about someone. You've got that. But that's not what you really want. You can't afford to have a ton of analysts sitting around manually looking things up. It doesn't work. Here's another model. Here, we got some collectors we're pulling in from Facebook, Pastebin, Reddit, Twitter, blah, 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 all over the internet. We're sucking that stuff in. We're going to Hadoop, and we're actually doing something with it. We're logging massive amounts of data, quite a of data. But we push a lot of that data. We develop the use cases that say, what's interesting to us? What would we want to know about? And what are those data elements that we need? So we're pulling that data, sucks out of a tube, goes into our site, and I get the right correlation rules that says, if this happens, do that. This is a very common framework that you're starting to see being developed because no one wants to spend $3 million on a commercial sim. And most commercial sims, when I start talking 300,000 to 500,000 events per second, you know, they have to go use the restroom because it scares them. It really scares them. All right. So now we've collected it, we've ingested it, we're doing something cool with it. One of the things that we're seeing out here now, and if you're a federal government or you're on the cutting edge, you want to be able to share data now, magically, through a, a common format, Sticks, Cybot, Taxi, um, Crits is free. You can upload all kinds of cool stuff. Um, if you see up here, emails, indicators, IPs, PCAPs, we're taking tons of data, putting it into this Crits software, has like the VM you can download and play with. You can suck all this data in, and look at this. Now we got this guy, Victor, is tied to all of these things. And now I can take this data and say, share this to all my people in my health care group, share this to all my people in the feds. Sh sharing data, collaboration is going to save your bacon. I can tell you that right now. And it's free. Um, <clears throat> this is magic, by the way. If you have a sim developer that can write very good correlation rules where your SOC people aren't pissed off because there's so many false positives, you better get what you're calling. Um, anybody can write a piece of intel that says, I'm going there. You know that if you're going there, it's bad. No question about it. You type, you write the rule in, it says, if this, this, and this, we know it's bad. It's, it's like, we know, there's no magic. The, the, the real piece of magic, not pure freaking magic, is <coughs> turning around and taking multiple pieces of intelligence and activity and tying that all together where you have two point 
three million events per hour, your site can't handle that. You need to sift, filter, collate, get it down to the point where you give them very actionable, direct, and interesting intelligence that they better act on. Otherwise, they're going to be in trouble. Um, one of the things I, I kind of skipped over, <clears throat> remember Target? They all got the fire eye alerts. Does it happen? They weren't looking at the logs. What do you think that's going to do to their liability? Do not collect data that you're just going to sit there and do nothing with. Think about that. Yeah, we had the data. Yeah, we saw we were breached. We didn't feel like looking at it. We didn't do anything with it. Talk to an attorney about that, see how that works out. <laughs> anyway, threat intelligence, you got it, do no harm. Uh, remember the UPS hack, was it last year? This organization said, our policy is that organizations hack, we block their whole domain. They block UPS.com. <laughs> oh, that hurt. I'm glad that wasn't me. So, when you do it, see the validated threat. Common sense that we write memos of understanding when senior management says, this is what we're gonna do when we see this really bad stuff. And they go, yep, good, sign here. So if we have a block UPS type of activity and you wanna roast us, that's what we agreed on. That is our standard operating procedure. So all that data, not only are you gonna feed that to the SIM, if you have one, they're free, you can get them, you don't wanna spend a ton of money, but take that data Feed your web sense or your iron port or your proxy list with bad domains, bad IPs, bad stuff. And it goes to Palo Alto, you can publish a list and Palo Alto will grab that and say, oh, this is bad stuff. Every five minutes we pull bad stuff and populate the firewall to say, block it. Same thing with IPS signatures. I write custom IPS signatures on Palo Alto all the time based on threat intelligence. And I've got this other scheme where I push up all the threat intelligence up to the semantic who can't find anything, but when you push it back down, it pushes to all the clients, and it works. It's a way to kind of help them, help themselves. Um, and of course, we feed it back to the list, and security analysts use the Medicaid. Um, we know that people on RSA likes to be on our site, but they're stuck with that. Five minutes left. Any questions? Done? Um, You want to tell you what I've seen? Okay. <clears throat> um, I worked with kind of the new stuff like Bromium. Maybe I play with Bromium. Yeah, cool stuff. I, I looked at it last year. Wasn't quite ready. It might be ready now. Very promising. Cybera. Uh, Palo Alto just bought Cybera. Deployed it at some extremely large banks. After three months, guess what they did? They didn't renew their AV. They took AV off of 186,000 PCs. Same thing with Invincia. They're not to the point where they trust, well, this one DOD customer, they don't have AV, they have Invincia. They did the painstaking task of application whitelisting, virtualizing all the apps that they're running. I tell you, all the guys that were doing all the response are doing something else. It, it will save your bacon because AV doesn't cut it. Uh, you know what? They bought one of my favorite. They bought Solera Networks. They got some cool stuff there. Um, I don't know what anybody's paying for. I couldn't tell you. Anybody else? Anybody? Anybody? Anybody wants to come twice? Thanks very much. Hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.